So uh, first, let's uh, talk definitions here a little bit, just to clarify. Technological optimist uh, is someone who uh, strongly believes in the power of technology. It's liberating power. So modern medicine liberates us from disease. You know, telecommunications uh, liberates our voice, gives us equality. Uh, space exploration physically liberates us from Earth. So it's, um, and although it's not really confined to any time or space, it's, uh, you know, the American modernist movement of the 50s and 60s was kind of like a, uh, an exemplar of, of what, uh, what we mean by technological optimism. And uh, there's a lot of basis of support for this. So uh, the average life expectancy has been slowly uh, increasing worldwide. Uh, over time, uh, the uh, ext extreme poverty has been uh, decreasing over time. So these are all uh, signs for why we would be technological optimists. And uh, I should say that like currently we would say like say Silicon Valley is home to a lot of technological optimists. They, there, there's a lot of uh, technological solutions being proposed for all kinds of problems in the world. And so they're, they see technology, technology as being uh, a liberating power. And then technological skeptics are the, the, those who kind of reject that idea of a technology as panacea paradigm and they, uh, You'll see this is kind of like in the postmodern era, uh, some, sometimes like uh, started to build in the 20th century, uh, especially after uh, you know the Cold War. And uh, you see a, a lot of, uh, in the environmental movement, a lot of critique of industrialization. And um, the, the early uh, beginnings of this is the, the Luddite Rebellion, obviously. Uh, it's like probably the most famous one that was like a, uh, for those not familiar with the history of it, so, uh, it was like a brief spasm of violence in the uh, early 1800s, uh, like 1811, 12, 13. With, and that was a reaction to the social upheaval caused by uh, steam engine, power loom, shifting the wool industry in Central Europe uh, from the cottage weavers to the power mills. And uh, all the adults, uh, you know, adult males, became unemployed and, and we saw the in increase of uh, child labor being used to, to run these. And, and so there was this kind of like uh, a technological backlash. And, uh, and it's probably no coincidence that uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is kind of a, a seminal example of technological skepticism, was published in London in 1818, just a, a few years later. And, and so, uh, as I said, the, the basis of support for technological skeptics is, is this idea of, uh, you know, environmental damage, uh, increasing pollution, biodiversity loss, climate change. These are all things that are sh showing that the world is getting worse, you know, as opposed to the world is getting better. And then there's, you know, the rapid social disruption, economic instability that rapid uh, technological change causes. So. So once we've uh, got these basis uh, of definitions here, like what is, uh, how can we ex uh, discuss and uh, explain how these technological risk attitudes are, arise? So, so I'm gonna just kind of review some of the uh, theories here. And uh, I'm not sure if this icon is was the best choice. It, it looks like a person sitting in a garbage can, but it's supposed to be someone behind a lectern. Uh, cultural theory of risk. This is the, probably the most famous, one of the most famous uh, explanations for how uh, technological uh, risk attitudes arise. And um, so this uh, originated from the uh, anthropologist Mary Douglas and political science scientist Aaron uh, Woldevsky. And uh, so we, they, uh, 
it was Douglas who originated it and Woldowski who kind of like uh, the two of them worked out some of the details together and kind of elaborated this. And uh, they came up with these four risk ideologies. And uh, the first one was the, this uh, individualists, the egalitarians, the hierarchists, and the fatalists. And the idea was that these arose from uh, correlating uh, people's risk uh, perceptions and risk feelings to um, uh, two, two characteristics, this uh, group versus grid. The group being like, are you uh, a more individualized person or an, uh, a more collective type person uh, in your sensibilities? And the grid is like, how much uh, feeling that you have agency? Do you have self-control or is uh, control uh, imposed on the out by the outside? And so um, the way it it works here as we would say that, uh, you know, so the individualists are kind of like uh, today's libertarians, you know, they feel that they have uh, control and they're very individual centered. They feel like nature is stable and boundless and uh, they think that human ingenu ingenuity can kind of like conquer all. So it, they're, uh, they're kind of like the technological optimists and, and, per my definition. Then uh, we have the social justice egalitarians and they are uh, more concerned uh, in the group sense, they, they take a more precautionary view of technology and so they would be the technological skeptics. The hierarchists, um, uh, the hierarchists would be uh, the people who are, um, uh, believe in uh, the outside imposition of uh, control and they tend to be more follow the authorities and experts uh, and and then lastly you have the the fatalists who kind of lock opt themselves out of policy making because they just feel like uh, both nature and society is uh, capricious and there's there's really no control and, and don't bother so um, it's a very, um, very convincing kind of uh, elegant theory, uh, but despite its theor theoretical elegance, uh, it kind of has a limited predictive success. For, for example, uh, a study done in 2014 on uh, the cultural worldviews accounting for uh, the risk and benefits of child vac vaccine uh, they they found that only three percent of the variance was accounted for by this by cultural worldview. So it's it it looks good, but it's maybe not uh, super um, explanatory. Uh, then next we come to this is the one most popular in the kind of like uh, risk analysis community. The one that's uh, uh, discussed the most would be the psychometric methods. Um, Kind of championed by Paul Slovic. He did a seminal uh, 1987 risk perception paper published in Science. The chart is on the, the right side, kind of shows the um, dread, uh, dread versus uh, unknown risk. And uh, he, uh, you know, mapped a, a whole bunch of different types of risks and, and helps us uh, compare how uh, risks are perceived. And uh, it's very useful for explaining kind of why the public risk perception often deviates from the calculated risk. So uh, that was its, you know, its big contrib contribution. And, and I should note that the psychometric methods and the Douglas and Woldowski's cultural theory, they both were coming out around the same time. So they were kind of like competing theories. Um, so, um, Again, this, uh, this is very useful for helping us kind of like explore uh, characteristics of, of different types of risk. And, uh, uh, but again, uh, despite all the, the detail it provides, it, it's kind of incomplete. And so um, there's a, here's an example, like a, a 2013 study of um, chemical industry in South Korea 
they found that uh, psychometric methods and cultural theory, they both accounted for less than 10% of the variance in, in perceived risk, which is, was less than just basic demographic features such as education level or gender. So uh, we're still kind of looking here for what, where do these technological risk attitudes come from? Um, a third one, uh, which is called cultural cognition theory of risk, was it's a hybrid of both cultural theory and psychometric models. Uh, Dan uh, Kahan and uh, Paul Slovic, again, have kind of worked on this. And um, this one basically uh, says that individuals are kind of preferentially selecting evidence that uh, that fits with their value system and their cultural group of which they identify. And it's kind of mixing both worlds in that it's uh, including the individualistic tendencies, uh, but it's also acknowledging that people exist within uh, cultural groups and, and, and they self-identify with, with others' experience. And so um, this one is uh, an interesting theory in th because it, it does kind of provide some useful, um, useful insight for uh, risk communicators. One is that uh, like evidence is more credible when ex experts appear to share the audience values. So um, uh, one thing that could, uh, this, the outcome of this is that uh, scientists have kind of found that um, they're more successful when they directly engage with local public rather than kind of like lecturing them via social media. So, you know, someone from the com your own community has more kind of cultural credibility. So if you go to the your public library and give a, a lecture on climate change, you're much more likely to uh, uh, gain adherence and, and kind of like open up a discussion with someone than if you, uh, you know, post uh, an angry Twitter rant or something like that, you know? So, and uh, the framing is important too. So information is more accepted if presented uh, as consistent with existing cultural values and uh, people have uh, praised like Pope Francis for this, for kind of like taking the climate change uh, issue and, and kind of folding it into Christian values to bring more people on board with that. So. Um, Uh, again, though, uh, because it's kind of like the, it's a child of both cultural theory and psychometric models, you kind of end up with something that still doesn't quite uh, get at uh, what's, what's the basis of technological risk attitudes. So um, there's a bunch of other theories out there, too, uh, that are worth kind of exploring. And um, one is just like uh, from uh, philosophers, uh, Jacques Ellul and Martin Heidegger, they both um, did a lot of writing on uh, technological risk or technological attitudes and how technology and society uh, interact. And, and they often tended to frame uh, our ideas on risk attitudes towards um, trust. So. Uh, how reliable is the technology in our, how wise are we in using it? So uh, it's a, like an interesting way to frame uh, technological risk. And then uh, there's a good one here from sociologist Daniel Fox. He, was, he came up with this term technocratic solutionism. So he was probably a bit of a technological skeptic. Uh, basically said technological optimism is, is basically just fatigue with the political process. So, you know, if, if we can't use the political process to solve a problem, let's just use technology to fix it. So the idea is that, that conflicts about ideas, values, and interests might have a technological solution. And so like an example of that would be like in the 20th century, there was a, a lot of discussion about, you know, um, how do we solve world hunger? And it was um, it was actually uh, after uh, some research and a Nobel Prize in economics came out of it was um, 
uh, Amartya Sen, uh, basically found that uh, famines in the 20th century were mostly due to bad governance you know, and hoarding and corruption, which is a social problem rather than uh, you know, inadequate food supply, which is a, a technical problem. And, and so the question becomes, how, how do you know when to uh, apply a, a technical solution and uh, to a, a technical problem or a social problem? And uh, it, it can get complicated. So um, I just want to touch on like uh, two more issues, uh, two more possible explanations. I haven't seen these kind of uh, proposed elsewhere, and I, and I thought they're worth uh, discussing a little bit, uh, like as a basis for technological risk attitudes. Uh, one comes from the social, social psychologist uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, I think he's at Yale. Uh, he talks about the differences in ethical value systems. So it's like the foundations of moral uh, thinking. So like uh, Jonathan's work here was uh, to break up moral thinking into some basic themes. And he labeled them as um, all, all uh, ethical systems uh, are, have these basic central concepts, uh, prevention of harm, fairness, liberty, loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And the thing that uh, he was focused on was how this uh, influences politics. So, his work basically found that while everyone considers all these separate uh, concerns, your ide political ideology tends to uh, emphasize one over the other. So uh, liberals tend to focus on prevention of harm and fairness. Libertarians, no surprise, focus on liberty. And conservatives tend to focus on loyalty, authority, and sanctity. And uh, like an example of that would be um, the bioethicist uh, Leon uh, Cass. Uh, he was the chairman of uh, President George W. Bush's uh, Council on Bioethics, where they uh, uh, kind of uh, put a slight ban on stem cell research. And um, he was uh, he had this uh, theory called the wisdom of repugnance, which is basically a a pure, you know, sanctity. So there does seem to be some uh, some weight to this particular theory. And if you apply that to technological risk, you could see that, say, liberals might be skeptical about technologies that have uh, environmental impacts because you want to prevent harm, and they might be optimistic about uh, things that. Uh, encourage fairness. So like they might be optimistic about social media that encourages equality. Whereas conservatives might be uh, skeptical of a medical technology that offends their sense of sanctity, but they might be optimistic about a military technology that reinforces authority. So uh, using these ideas, you can kind of say that this would be a bit of an explanation for why technological attitudes don't uh, just clearly aligned with political ideology, meaning, you know, liberals just aren't technological optimists and conservatives aren't just technological skeptics. It's, 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 a, it's more complicated than this. Uh, another one uh, is by the called social epistemologist Steve Fuller, which, which is a fancy way of saying um, he's a philosopher of science who now does sociology. And um, he has talked a little bit about uh, the reordering of political ideologies. And uh, the idea is that you shift, there's going to be a reordering of the political ideology from uh, left and right, liberal conservative, to up and down. And um, he borrows the, uh, the term, he borrows that from uh, uh, a futurist writer from the 1970s, F.M. Uh, Esfandieri, he was also known as uh, F.M. 2030. If you don't know anything about him, look him up, he's a fascinating fellow. Anyway, um, so 
this left-right distinction is a, you know, a pure politics distinction. Uh, it's the role of the state, uh, you know, and, and just a bit of a fun fact, uh, if you don't know the, these labels come from the, originally from the French National Assembly during the time of the revolution, those who uh, wanted to preserve monarchy and, and, uh, and like tradition said on the right, of the assembly, whereas those who wanted to try new rationalist enlightenment ideas sat on the left. So get your uh, left and The idea here is that the old political distinctions on the role of the state are becoming less important in the role of technology, which is, you know, uh, becoming increasingly powerful, is becoming the new, uh, the new um, focus of, around which we, uh, we will be aligning. And so, so the distinction about that role of the state, saying that the left was the state can enhance civil society while the right thinks the state is merely just a caretaker of social institutions. But now we're saying that uh, we have these technological optimists or, or uh, upwingers who are, they believe in making humanity more than it uh, it currently is, and they, uh, the downwingers kind of believe that humanity is kind of like solidly bound by evolution in Earth's, Earth, so they're uh, slightly more technological. And so the risk uh, implication is the upwingers are kind of like the tech optimists and the downwingers are the, the tech skeptics. And uh, Steve Fuller has used the terms pro-actionary and precautionary, which which I like too. And um, the, this is a, an idea I, th I think is worth exploring more in the future. Um, you know, kind of the way to think about this is, is uh, this realignment is not going to just be why well, like a lot of the uh, liberal left will become upwingers, and a lot of the conservative right will become downwingers. There'll be a, a mix of both. It's it's not exactly quite the same. So uh, the upwingers are going to be from the left, the kind of like the technocratic left and the libertarian right, while the downwingers will be kind of like environmentalists from the the left and the religious conservatives from the right. So um, kind of like the the downwinger figurehead would be like a communitarian traditionalist like Pope Francis, whereas the upwinger figurehead will be more of a technocratic libertarian style character. Poor choice. So kind of explaining these technological risk attitudes, uh, in the end, none of these individual theories are kind of complete. So, and the reason I say this is because, um, you know, people are complex and it's, it's easy enough to imagine a person, person who is kind of like supportive of, of medical research, supports, thinks geoengineering might be a good idea um, as a kind of like a temporary solution to climate change, but also uh, is very skeptical of social media or skeptical of GMOs. For, for whatever reason. So um, how would we classify that person's technological ideology? Are they an optimist or a skeptic? The thing about all, discussing all these technological risk attitudes is they do give us kind of like a general idea of all the factors that are in play. And, um, and one thing more we can kind of say is from various studies, uh, the more multi-dimensional measures tend to, to be better. So it just shows you that, you know, people are complex. So complex measures tend to measure them a little better. Slightly unsatisfying answer, but, um, but it's what we have right now. So towards how technological risk attitudes might change over time. And, and this is a, an interesting question because uh, if someone just has a technological risk attitude that's kind of set in stone, then presenting them with new information or new risk assessments kind of has limited value because you're 
probably not going to uh, change their attitudes. And, and we should say that even though, uh, you know, the technological risk attitudes uh, are kind of like the heuristic model we use before, also become a lens, a biased lens through which we see all new information and therefore uh, they influence whether we can change our mind and, and how much, depending on how strong this bias is. So let's talk about how these, uh, these change over time. And we know that uh, they do change over time. There's these social trends. The, there was, as we mentioned before, the modernism versus the postmodernism. And um, one interesting way to kind of trace this is through uh, the evolution of, of uh, science fiction. So, for example, like the, the late uh, 19th century was kind of like the early romantic era, era of science fiction. And uh, if you know anything about Jules Verne's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, uh, there was, uh, the, they were sailing around in the submarine called the Nautilus, which was a technological marvel of its time. And it explored and cataloged nature and it aided the oppressed. And, and most people uh, who haven't read the book might not know that it, it also was, uh, it opposed mil militarism. It would, it would basically sail around and Sink, mil sink military ships. So it was um, uh, kind of a utopian theory of, of, of the potential of technology. So it was a very technologically optimistic time. And then uh, subsequently, kind of like 20th century, you start seeing uh, this trend towards technological skepticism. Uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, published in 1932, is kind of like an epitome of that um, you know, like all literature, dystopian science fiction is kind of a product of its time. So the Cold War gives you kind of the nuclear annihilation inspired uh, dystopias. Um, a Canticle for Leibowitz was published in 1959. Kurt Vonnegut's uh, Cat's Cradle in 1963. These are, uh, you know, very much technologically skeptical pieces of work. And then more recently, you start seeing, um, in, you know, in the past, you know, 20 years or so, a lot of the uh, technological dystopian science fiction tends to be. And um, we also know that uh, individuals can also change uh, personally their technological risk attitudes. So, for example, uh, someone who has an experience, a positive experience with a, a medical device might make them more uh, technologically optimistic. Um, some examples, uh, there is um, a fellow by the name of um, Michael Charest, who is a transhumanist advocate. He had his hearing restored with a cochlear implant, and it He's written about that extensively. It's uh, interesting. There's also a fellow, Neil Harbison, who was um, born total, totally colorblind. He just sees in black and white. And he had a sensor uh, kind of uh, attached to him that uh, converts color into sound so he could hear color. And uh, not only did that do that, but he extended the range of the sensor so he could also hear infrared and ultraviolet. So he could hear hear things that uh, we we can't even see so that's, they're kind of like on the the forefront of the transhumanist movement and hear things we can't even see yes so um th those are kind of like the positive experiences now on the other hand of that, you can have the negative experiences, uh, automations, effects. Uh, so just thinking like a kind of a fun game to play is like, think of jobs that have only existed in the 20th century. The technology did not exist beforehand uh, and it doesn't exist now. So like video store clerks, photo lab employees, toll booth attendants, they're rapidly 
disappearing telephone operators, travel agents soon to be. So there's, you know, all this technological, the rapid change of technology kind of uh, moves uh, socioeconomic uh, situations along faster than they ever did in the past. You know, people were farmers for centuries and millennia on end. So um, now we kind of are, are kind of caught up in this whirlwind of, of fast moving uh, conditions. And, and that can have uh, negative effects on people's views of technology. So uh, we also know that uh, technological risk attitudes can vary be, by geography. Uh, there's been some uh, studies suggesting that um, less industrialized countries tend to be more technologically optimistic, seeing the positives of it. Uh, uh, we also know that they uh, change uh, from location to location. Um, even within highly industrialized nations. So an uh, interesting example, uh, there was a study uh, paper by this uh, uh, science historian, Mark Bowles, who uh, he uh, did some work um, uh, looking at the first practical uh, differential analyzers. They were the mechanical, man mechanical computers uh, pre-World War II, so in the like 1930 to 1945 era. And it kind of raised the question of, so we know that Great Britain was kind of the center of early uh, computer innovation. Uh, a lot of the early uh, computer theory came from, from Great Britain. So why is Silicon Valley in the US? And, and maybe part of the explanation the this technological optimism. So uh, the mechanical computers of you know, pre-World War II uh, they were, although invented uh, originally by uh, in Great Britain, the uh, the first kind of like functional ones were like Vannevar Bush in the U.S. Uh, at MIT, and then uh, Douglas Hartree kind of took and refined that uh, technology in Great Britain. But uh, Vannevar Vannevar Bush was uh, an engineer. Uh, and introduced this to the engineering community, whereas in Great Britain, it was kind of introduced within the scientific community. So in, uh, Bush was able to kind of um, get a lot of support by the US engineering community who kind of enthusiastically adopted this. Um, Hartree was, uh, was uh, less able to, uh, to to break into the uh, you know the scientific community with with his uh, his clever uh, analytical uh, differential analyzer, and and so we know that um, you know there's variations in uh, in geography, but we also know that uh, this this complexity of of geographical trends is also you know it's mixed in the sense that. So in, in the US, while there might be a lot of uh, technological uh, optimism compared to some other places, you know, Silicon Valley kind of being the, uh, like the prime example, uh, American anti-scientism, uh, scientific uh, bent, as we all know, uh, just, just read the headlines, how many, uh, climate deniers there are in the U.S. compared to, uh, you know, the rest of the industrialized world, you know, and, and you know, the anti-vaccine movement in the U.S. is quite strong, despite the fact that the National Institute of Health is the uh, the largest funder of biomedical research in the world. So there's, there's obviously a, kind of these weird dichotomies that, it, that coexist. So uh, just to kind of summarize all this up. So despite the lack of a, a comprehensive theory, we, we know that technological risks are influenced by all these factors, cultures, cultural feelings, personal circumstances, and they do kind of move over time at both the individual and, and societal level. So do these observations have any implications 
for science and technology policy policy decision making and, and can we make any general statements so I'm going to kind of like end this up on uh, here's my uh, controversial um, idea for the day uh, and I've kind of proposed this kind of principle of dangerous or controversial science that kind of comes from this and and so we'll start with just the observation that History of science kind of shows that if something can be done, uh, people will try to do it. And secondly, we know that very few lines of research have been banned or abandoned in the past, past for any reasons that are kind of unrelated to practicality. So there are plenty of things that have been abandoned in the past, such as, you know, lobotomies, which, you know, by the way, won uh, the Nobel Prize in, I think it was 1947, around there. And, uh, you know, after a few years, people realized that maybe that was not such a good idea. And so it was abandoned for practical reasons. But uh, essentially, um, the most uh, practical, useful science kind of moves along. So in terms of you know, this, this first observation, that's kind of like the basis of, of capitalism. If someone has a good idea, someone's gonna try it and there's gonna be a race for success to get to there. And then the observation two, that uh, for example, in the US, there's only been uh, a moratoria on research in three occasions. The recombinant DNA research uh, moratoria in 1974, that was lifted within a year. Uh, Human reproductive cloning, that was done in 1997, which still unofficially is in place. And there was an influenza gain of research moratoria in 2012, which was lifted in 2017. And I should say about the human cloning that uh, although there were several attempts uh, in 1997, 2001, 2003, and 2005, they never actually ever banned human cloning in the US. It, it could never, uh, it could never pass as a law, and it was all inspired by the birth of Dolly the sheep back in 1996. It created a a, a big uh, media frenzy, and people started thinking all kinds of dystopian things about it. But once they realized that the, the defect rates were very high in cloned animals, they kind of like the the commercial interest kind of disappeared. So. It, it's, it kind of was forgotten. Uh, that said, uh, you can get your dog cloned in, in uh, South Korea right now for about $100,000. So it's still, still an idea that's out there and, and kind of used. And in um, 2018, uh, a Chinese lab announced that they had successfully uh, cloned macaques, which they were wanted to use for uh, medical studies to have like perfectly identical animals to uh, reduce the number of um, you know, the number of um, you know uncertainties within their experiments and and so basically we've we've gotten to the point now where so now we can clone primates it's known this can be done so this kind of suggests that the hurdles to human cloning are basically negligible so in the the end. That, that ban kind of really didn't stop anything. We've walked right up to the line and without passing it. So, so kind of uh, reinforces this idea if there's a, a new biotechnology that has a use, someone, someone's gonna do it. So uh, the result of this kind of like, of these opposing risk attitudes, and this is where I bring in the risk attitudes, is that moral arguments against what are considered to be like either physically dangerous or ethically dangerous science are tend to be downplayed because people can't kind of meet on the on the same ground and then policymakers just tend to be kind of like permissive they're like well let's let's move slowly but let's do it and so this principle of dangerous science is that no line of research or technology is going to be banned on moral grounds
Now, here's an example of, of, of this in action. I, I was gonna go through a, a lot more, but I realized I was gonna run out of time. So let's just talk about one here. Here in, uh, in 2015, uh, some Stanford synthetic biologists, they bioengineered yeast to convert sugar into morphine and uh, the, the complete process. There was, they had been working on the steps uh, up to that point, but they got it uh, to work. It didn't create uh, commercially viable amounts of it, but they uh, started up a, a biotech startup, Anthea, I think it's called, uh, to generate commercially viable amounts. Um, at this point, uh, they're still working on it, but they're kind of working on side projects too. Um, that said, the fact that this work was done in the first place is kind of interesting because the researchers said that they, what they really wanted to do was to help address existing uh, pain management crises that, that occur in, uh, in poor countries. So how, how do we make cheaper uh, pain uh, palliative care in, uh, in poor countries? Uh, the interesting thing here though is that um, in many countries, uh, any pain medication shortages are actually caused by policy decisions. So there are a lot of uh, countries in Africa that are very hesitant to import or uh, use uh, op opioids because they know of their addictive nature, are very concerned about that. And, um, and, and so it's a policy issue. They've, they've kind of cut off the supply. Um, so it, it's actually not a, a price issue. And um, there, was, there was actually uh, a 2017 re Lancet report that estimated that the global need for morphine had a retail cost of a, less than $150 million per year. So that, that seems like a lot of money uh, to one person, but like on the global scale, that, that's uh, almost nothing. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, uh, Uganda, which has uh, attempted to increase their palliative care supply, they, they have uh, changed their policy so that they, uh, they can use liquid morphine there. And a week supply costs like $2. So there's, there's, no, there's actually no commercial need for this uh, in, the, in the sense that uh, we don't actually need cheaper painkillers. And, and the also interesting thing is that this whole work was done kind of in the, the midst of a, an opioid addiction wave in the US. So in, when this hit the headlines, they started talking about homebrew heroin. You know, you could basically, if you could uh, brew beer, then you could make heroin. And um, so despite the obvious potential misuse for this, uh, the research was done. It was funded by, uh, it was funded by the NIH uh, and a few other uh, organizations. And you know, uh, under the idea that uh, you could reduce costs, production costs. And uh, it's interesting because uh, one of the other uh, reasons that it was proposed is you could say, well, uh, opium poppy production has been funding military conflicts in Afghanistan, but that was also black market uh, opium production. So unless you gave the black market uh, homebrew heroin, then it, it really wouldn't solve that problem. Uh, it, would, it would basically just impact the legal farming that goes on in India, Turkey, and Australia. So um, this kind of smacked of the someone coming up with an idea and then uh, looking for a problem to fit the, the solution to. And um, so what are the uh, kind of the implications of all this? And the implication of kind of this principle of dangerous science is that, well, uh, Research is probably going to continue. So don't worry too much, as much about the science attitudes as uh, is made in the papers. Science tends to be pretty useful. And in the end, uh, despite what uh, much hand wringing, uh, science tends to prevail. People uh, will still go to their doctors 
to, to get uh, information and will still uh, support science. It's, it's maybe okay to push back a little harder in order to make sure that the science we want to be done should be done right. And, um, but most importantly, if uh, one has an, uh, a problem with the way a particular line of science research is being done, um, one should probably look for pragmatic, practical reasons, not moral or ethical arguments for why this should be done because those, the moral arguments tend, to, tend not to go anywhere. And that is it. And I will open it up to questions. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Um, I can't really do an applause through Zoom, but um, I guess we'll try and psychically translate it over. Um, yeah, so we'll open up for questions. Um, and I'm not sure how we can best moderate it, but I think people will jump in and then if someone talks at the same time, we'll just negotiate on those lines. But um, one thing that does pop into my mind is, um, is there any point to, or can we limit um, certain um, approaches to science? Um, just because I don't think there's a pervading attitude with, this, with scientists where um, you think, well, science is quite pure, it's just research, it's curiosity, um, with less thought about kind of wider impacts. But it brings to mind um, of a paper that was released last year, for example, which um, kind of looked at the genetic basis for homosexuality and it says, but it can't be down to one gene and there's a lot of different factors and you can't use that to predict if someone's gay or not. But then that didn't stop someone trying to build an app to predict some if it's gay or not. I remember that app was also um, developed, or one of the developers was based in Uganda, which is also currently pushing a, a death penalty. So I remember a lot, reading a lot of anxiety online and Twitter, so it's just own bubble, but um, regarding that, and it's like, well, the scientists were just trying to look at something that was interesting, but it seemed to have some kind of potentially negative side effects. So is there a point to, at what, what point do you, pragmatically say, or maybe we should go in that direction, even if just from a scientific perspective, it doesn't look dangerous. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, we know that, so like when people take uh, like a responsible conduct of science course in graduate school, um, they'll talk about, you know, um, proper methodology, care of uh, patients and animals, uh, publication uh, responsibility in terms of like authorship and, you know, all, all these things that you would do to be a good scientist. But then we don't really talk about uh, what happens after it gets out of the lab. So what are the social implications? And um, there was actually a, uh, it was a, an interesting piece. I think it was published in Nature uh, a couple of years ago. Um, one of the scientists who discovered uh, the CRISPR technique, she basically said, you know, I really didn't think science policy training was all that useful until I got shoved into the middle of this. And now, now I'm thinking we probably should do more of that. And um, I don't know that uh, discussing this in great detail kind of helps them all that much because sometimes you can't really anticipate, uh, you know, so you, you come up with uh, this, this interesting method for gene editing and then suddenly people want to start using it to, uh, you know, to modify the human genome. Uh, and, and you, you know, you can push back and say, well, we're not, not ready for that and I didn't develop it for this but you know sometimes a tool gets used in ways you have no idea of of how it's going to be used and and that would be the case in this case you know so someone's been doing some research on you know the genetic uh, links to homosexuality and, and then you know which is a, a fascinating topic but then when someone wants to use it to uh, to start uh, labeling and punishing people, 
you, you know, then you're like, oh my God, what did I do? So uh, I, I guess one of the things that's important here is to be mindful of the total implications of the work in the sense that uh, things I might be doing here in a lab in Liverpool are great, but uh, how will they play in southern China or in Russia or in Venezuela or you know wherever? So, um, and and that kind type of uh, thinking can kind of lead you into uh, inactions possibly, but. Um, it is good to consider these things as much as possible because it leaves you a little more prepared. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of it's just trying to kind of find that line of where is a species you should do versus like, what is it more about the communication of it? But I think it's quite hard to kind of find the optimum there. Um, yeah, has anyone else got any questions to just jump in and ask? I've got one if no one else. Wants to jump in? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just do we think there's also a like an element of the the social economic status and like class of an individual in relation to this technical skepticism and technical optimism? Um, just think it like there's been like there's been a lot of left wing movements that were extremely technologically optimist in that they viewed industry. Uh, working classes and things, but we're very, very skeptical of the current place that technology was held in society. And I think that reflects quite well with a lot of skepticism people have with technologies today in that it's seen not as something that is liberating for them, but something that is used for others to try and extract something from them. It's not necessarily that they're skeptical, but they, they're skeptical of the, the way in which this, the technology is potentially going to be used, and they don't think it's being wielded for their benefit. Not, not necessarily to say that they're not optimistic, but like there's, there's like another, yet another axis on like these like multi Yeah, it is a very complex issue, but just another axis on these graphs. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, I think it's, it's not even much of a secret in uh, Silicon Valley amongst the uh, uh, AI machine learning uh, set that um, whoever develops you know, the best algorithms are going to kind of control the economy. Uh, they, you know, mm. who has the the best robots will win. And um, there was actually a, a really, uh, I, I don't remember the exact date it was, it was put out, it was a, a few years ago, but there was an interesting uh, comparison between, published to, between um, uh, miners in the US versus miners in Scandinavia. And American miners, uh, coal miners and uh, uh, metal miners uh, were very concerned about the use of technology because they thought that you add better machines and it's going to put them out of, out of work. Whereas the Scandinavian miners were welcoming this technology because it made their jobs cleaner and safer and more professionalized. And they knew that uh, because they came from uh, a tradition with strong labor unions, that their job was going to be protected. And that, so their, uh, their socioeconomic condition very much influenced their attitude about tech. Would you say that's a, a view reflected in a lot of the, like a lot of the, the research you've uh, put together building into this? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't call out socioeconomics per se uh, too strongly. I, I mentioned it briefly, but mm. 
it, but it's definitely an influence for sure. Okay. So then, uh, may I ask you this upwinger idea? I've never heard of this before. Is it the is it the label with which I can group the anti vaxxers and the five G vandals and the and the people in the Bush administration who banned stem cells? Is so the left and the right can all be who who are these? Okay, yeah, um, good. Yeah, it, it's a it's a weird concept. So the upwingers are the people who believe that science good well science is good and that it uh creates kind of like unlimited human potential so it's the people who want to uh they're the transhumanists and the people who want to upload our consciousness into computers and launch ourselves into uh outer space and settle on Mars and, you know, every science, awesome science fiction idea you've thought of, those are the upwingers. And the downwingers are the anti-vaxxers and the, the Bush uh, banners and the anti-vaxxers and the 5G vans. Uh, yes, but uh, it's not necessarily an anti-science um, group per se, but it's, it's a group that sees science with more skepticism. So it, it not necessarily uh, saying that, uh, it's not necessarily just people who, you know, love conspiracy theories, but, but also those who kind of believe that technology uh, is limiting uh, and that it doesn't necessarily make our lives better and, um, so maybe kind of like the deep ecologists. Right, the earth first. So these earth first and anti-vaxxers and 5G vandals, they're the jihadists of the downwingers. Yes, yes, that would be a, a good way of putting it. Okay, okay. So I, I take, I, I, it seems to me that there are plenty of times when science has uh, been banned for fear of what it might achieve and, and but the, usually those bans happen as a self-censorship, perhaps. I mean, that's what happens after the war with the eugenics movement. There's a, all kinds of research in eugenics, and although a lot of that just got renamed, um, certainly we don't do research in the areas of eugenics that we used to do in the, you know, in the 20s and the 10s. So is that not true? Do you think that there's not... societal banning it seems to me yeah that that is uh absolutely true self censorship is uh certainly important uh you know and then also like if you want to kill off any line of research just associate it with hitler so right. you know, that that'll do it right there but 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 that aside you know um hitler was a really a bad idea in its own right <laughs> what what what's not a bad idea what? I, I missed that last point. Well, just just the idea. So um, the uh, the human genome um, movement, you know, where where people are talking about uh, doing uh, human genome editing, right. that has brought up a lot of concerns about, you know, is this is this eugenics brought back? Yeah, of like, course. Yeah, yeah. So so not our not only are we going to try to cure people of uh, hereditary diseases, but we're also going to attempt to, um, we're also going to be taller and better looking and smarter and... And less gay and, and also less deaf. I mean, the deaf community went berserk when that was discussed in, for them. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so there's, there's the, uh, you know, so not only is there all these concerns about racism and sexism, but ableism and, you know, all those other terrible stereotypes. So you don't think that we should be worrying about the anti-science critics and the anti-vaxxers and the flat earthers? I, I'm, I've been terribly worried, so you don't think we should be worried? I, uh, I'm not saying that you can't, you don't have to worry. 
but I will say that the scientific community has maybe gotten a little um, overly concerned. And, and I'll just explain that in the sense that um, there are polls done on a regular basis for like how people feel about certain institutions and scientists still rank higher than essentially any other field. Wait. So like, even oh. though scientists are less respected than they were say 50 years ago during the height of you know, the space age, yeah. people's views of politicians and you know, other uh, groups have gone down much faster. So uh, the, the way I kind of think of it is you know, there's been this kind of mass movement to um, question authority, which I think is a good thing. Um, unfortunately, now we also question expertise, which is a less good thing. Probably still good though. <laughs> Dep depending on how yeah, much they claim. The expert or not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you would you say that this um, way of thinking, uh, um, there are the people who advocate for um, for science, like for, to 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 put brains in, and so on? Would you say that that's a typical way of thinking from developed countries? Because I can't imagine a farmer from Uganda uh, thinking about that. The, the, the people from um, developing countries, they just want food, you know. Um, it's like a whimsical problem to me. Um, it's it's useless. It's, it doesn't make it. I mean, I don't see any benefit of sending people to Mars or putting brains in computers when there are millions of people without food on Earth. Uh, do you think this way of thinking is dominated by people from the, from developed countries? Uh, uh, I would say, you know, I. I can't speak for everyone for a developed from a developed country, uh, but 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 essentially, I, I don't think that uh, that is a widely held belief. Uh, I think the, you know, the extreme kind of upwinger, we'll call it like the Elon Musk idea. He's he's on a, multiple occasions mentioned that he would like to die on on Mars and and not upon impact. So he uh, he he clearly has these kind of science fiction utopian ideals of, you know, the humanity expanding into uh, the outer reaches and uh, being a multi-planet species. And to the average person, whether you're from uh, the US or Uganda, I, I slightly crazy, um, but, but fewer people in the U.S. see it as crazy, and I bet you a lot of people in Silicon Valley think it's an awesome idea, and and are actively trying to to work towards those ends. And and obviously, the richer you are, the the more you you have time to to worry about these sort of things. Yeah, that's that's why. Uh, I'll, I'll give my opinion about that because I'm from Brazil, okay. so. Uh, I think that there is a misconception there because usually those countries under development, they are not, not everyone is poor, not everyone is hungry, but the inequality is bigger. We have lots of very rich people and very poor people in a gap much, much, much worse than the UK, for example. So uh, I would say that at least in Brazil, I would say that people that are richer, they are more concerned about food than people that are poor. So uh, much more concerned about, they are not concerned about technology at all. Uh, good technology, good science. So yeah, I think it's kind of a pre preconception that you're having. Thank you. Disagree. Uh, a great point, uh, and it's it's wise not to make any um, generalizations about people from any particular country. Um, for example, the 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 person who originated the upwinger downwinger concept, this uh, uh, 
FMS Fandieri. He was uh, Iranian. So, uh, you know, obviously his thinking was, you know, decades or more ahead of most other people and people would not, you know, generally if you were making some kind of stereotypical assumptions would not consider, you know, Iranians the most progressive group of people in the world. And yet, you know, he, he was indeed a very progressive thinker. So, you know, it's, uh, it is always unwise to ascribe any particular thought to uh, a nationality or an ethnicity or a sex or an age group or a whatever. Yeah, I shouldn't probably mention any, any country uh, specifically, but um, yeah. Oh, I, I see your point, Hiki. It makes sense. So people that are hungry, they, they should not be concerned about science, top science. I see your point anyway. But they are probably the ones that are going to benefit the most. Um, well, I don't see many people, poor people questioning science, science as people, anti-vaxxers, for example, they are usually very rich people. Uh, so oh. I think... Mm. All I, all I was trying to say is that um, putting brains into computers or sending people to Mars are fictional problems created by rich people who try. It's like an excuse to keep doing stuff or, or science or whatever. But it's not, um, to me, it doesn't, it's not like a real problem to solve. Or, uh, and, I don't know. They, they, I don't know. It's just this. Uh, yeah, I should, probably should lie. Uh, no. Oh, sorry. You know, another way to, if you look at, one way to see like how people support science is look at uh, scientific uh, charities. So for example, um, billions of dollars are spent every year at uh, CERN and, uh, and other, you know, high energy uh, particle accelerators to uh, plumb the depths of of the ba basic particle physics, and there is a lot of phenomenal science to be learned from that. Um, but if you look at charities, there's there's not a lot of uh, particle physics charities, but uh, uh, the number of say like cancer research charities, there's a lot of those. So people uh, obviously have decided that they think cancer research is a really good idea. And I'm not saying that one type of science is far superior intellectually than the other, but one seems to have more practical resonance with, with the average human. So are you saying that I should, um, that I should go and stand on it with a collection bucket on a street corner for the particle physicists? Um, well, they, maybe. You know, maybe they're not they're not getting enough love. I don't know. Um, so I've got a question. It's sort of slightly, I suppose, it's sort of on topic in a sense, and sort of off topic. I read your um, epidemiology, um, and in it you do a critique of some of the WHO modelling. Um, that I thought was interesting and then I thought in the in the current climate with this view of some that um experts shouldn't be trusted is there any what do you think there are in terms from a, a science perspective the sort of the risk of showing all these models and look how many deaths there could have been if x y and z happened or didn't happen etc how do you think sort of those different groups that you've got and that sort of upwing and downwing model will take to those sorts of AI model getting it wrong, as it were. Yeah, that, that does present a problem. Um, I've always been a fan of being honest. And um, I know that, uh, you know, I, I'm not the only person who has said that, uh, you know, so I know I, 
this came from Scott when he said that you should uh, you should say just enough that you're being helpful, but not so much that you're lying. And uh, and I I thoroughly agree with that point. And one should uh, I think these modelers are good to uh, explain all the uncertainties in their model to uh, show all the projections and show the uncertainty and and the error in it too. And to even to go back and, and look at the old models that they've done and see how accurate they are. So they kind of do some self-assessment. These are all good things and this is how science progresses. If we don't do that, then, then we learn nothing. And the difference it maybe is that in the past, those conversations were done within the scientific community. And now we, they maybe get published, you know, prominently in the New York Times. And so now more people see that. And, you know, if, if you're reading this BBC article that says, you know, look at all these projections and some of them are wrong and this is how uncertain it is. There are certainly uh, anti-science sentiments out there and the, the, the anti-science movement is going to cherry pick and use that, you know, to their advantage. Much much like the climate deniers did, you know, with the uh, with the email strings that the internal email strings that were discussing exactly, you know, how to present graphs to the public, they you one can uh, interpret them as you will. Um, unfortunately, none of us can be experts in everything, and so. We just, we don't really have the time to do that. And, th and that's kind of where that cultural cognition theory comes out, where people tend to just turn to the experts they trust. And unfortunately, you know, if you, the expert you trust happens to be Donald Trump, then your, the, you know, the quality of the information you're getting is going to be quite, quite low. And I don't have a good solution as to how to get people to choose higher quality experts. That's a, a that's the uh, the big question. Well, I, I, it's not our job to tell people whom to read, but um, maybe to keep our own house in order, it would be pretty sensible, I think, to go back and you know, check ourselves. Um, and maybe that requires outsiders to do it in some, in a way that seems honest. But um, those Ebola numbers, if, if, if they were, if they were too high, and it looks like they were too high, uh, maybe that should cause some chagrin and it should cause some, you know, uh, some facing the nation as it were. I mean, you, otherwise you end up in a situation where everybody thinks you're so smart until your first error. I mean, nobody's talking about how smart Nate Silver is anymore. Right. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I, uh, the paper, I wasn't throwing those, uh, those particular projections out to see, look at these modelers have no idea what they're doing. It was, it was just really to say, look, there's a lot of uncertainty in this type of projections because you know, unlike an earthquake where the earthquake happens and, and then it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like independent of human action. An earthquake happens and any damage that occurs, the only human interaction there is like, did, did you have good building codes beforehand? And if you did, then you probably have minimal damage. And if you didn't, then you're going to have a lot of damage. But with a pandemic, it's, it's a moving disaster. And if you do the right things, you can change the course of the disaster itself. Whereas, you know, if you do nothing, it, it changes in a different direction. And, and so, is that how it, it, are like, you know, a magnitude order worse to predict? Is that how should we should interpret the apparent bias in the Ebola numbers? That they were, they could have been that bad, and they might have been. But look, uh, with smart thinking. The people in charge kept it low. Is that how we should be thinking of those numbers? Absolutely. And and for example, uh, one of the things I point out is like uh, someone an, uh, someone who was uh, 
positive for the uh, the Ebola virus, landed uh, in Lagos in Nigeria, and they immediately identified him as an uh, an Ebola patient and and you know treated him as such. If he had just wandered into one of the largest, most densely populated cities in Africa and spread it there, uh, the Ebola pandemic of uh, would have been, you know, a totally different story than than what it turned out to be. So tiny little thank God. like that can make a huge impact. Yeah, thank God he didn't land in Dallas. <laughs> exactly. And and you can see, you know, with the, the current pandemic, you can see that uh, the fact that the Taiwanese vice president happens to be a uh, an epidemiologist trained at Johns Hopkins University uh, clearly had a positive impact impact on 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 the pandemics you know how it played out in that country they did all the right things in the US we did not I think going um Sorry, unless anyone else wants to raise a question, I've got just another point on uh, like utopianism and looking at the perception of like the possibilities of science going back through science fiction literature. Um, and yeah, there's like there's kind of a distinct shift from like oh the look at all of these different possibilities to a much more concerned like anxious look at the potential of science. And I guess like do you think that things are starting to shift more one way or another now. And do you think there's anything in terms of communicating risks and scientific research that can be done to sort of help move things back more towards like people thinking of what's like, what a different world could look like with science rather than being scared about what science might do to them? Yeah, that's um, that's interesting question. I tend to think that the solutions are. Uh, I'm I'm more of a lumper than a splitter. Let's put it that way in theories. So what I mean by that is, I I tend to think that problems are tied together, mm. and uh, can't really be separated so easily. So I think a lot of the solutions to people having a better outlook on science are really policy related. So if people actually believe that there is a social safety net and that uh, they're, you're not gonna be put out of a job tomorrow by you know, automated software that eliminates their job and uh, they're not gonna be living on the streets and that there are in fact, uh, you know, that governments are not in fact run by large corporations but there are you know some represent actual representation for people mm. that those sorts of things will all give more confidence in you know in in all the various uh facets of life including science so uh, in terms of like, how do we make science more um, trustworthy and, and reliable for the average person? Uh, you know, a, as scientists, you, you know, one can only do the science in a responsible manner, uh, talk about it in a responsible manner. And public engagement is obviously important. Mm. And um, talk a little bit about it in, in my book, but, um, you know, in terms of science management, it's good to make sure that people feel like they're um, being uh, listened to, that they have a, a voice in, in their decisions. There's um, uh, a good example. Uh, there's a, um, uh, uh, a, I don't know if he's a bio, I will call him a bioengineer. Uh, at MIT, uh, Kevin Esfeldt. 
he is the person who kind of first proposed the gene drive, the idea of inserting a gene into a species that uh, gets preferentially inherited by subsequent generations. And then that, uh, that gene then spreads rapidly throughout the population and you can do various things with it. So for example, one of the proposals is you would uh, put in a gene that makes all mosquitoes male. And then it gets passed down and eventually you run out of female mosquitoes and then the local population, you know, dies out. And so that'll be one way to cure malaria, get rid of the, the mosquitoes that, that pass it on. And so people, like the idea of a gene drive is freaking some people totally out, which, you know, seems reasonable because driving species to extinction should not be done lightly. Kind of hard to unring a bell like that. Mm. And uh, so this Professor Esfelt has said, he's proposed several ways of making a gene drive, uh, making it kind of reversible or slowing it down. And he's actually talked to people uh, where they've thought about doing tests. So like he went to, I think it was like Martha's Vineyard in which is off of the coast of Massachusetts in the US. And they have a bad problem with Lyme disease, which is a, uh, it's a disease that's uh, passed along by ticks. So the tick is the vector for the, the disease. And it's rather debilitating if you don't, if you don't catch it in time and it can be hard to treat for some people. It's very, uh, it's the type of thing that you would like to get rid of if possible. So one of the things they were talking about was uh, the vector by which these ticks are trans, uh, uh, are, you know, fed is the, like a, a white footed mouse that is kind of endemic to the, the island. And he wanted to like say, should we, uh, should we add a gene drive to the mice so that they, they essentially are immune to, to uh, this disease and then they can't pass it along through the, uh, you know, the cycle. And then we would stop, stop these tick-borne diseases. So it's like when, and, and uh, the point I'm making is that he actually went to the meeting, to the community, had meetings. It's a relatively small island with not that many people. So he could actually interact with the people and get public buy-in on this idea. And so, you know, when you can, when you can do stuff like that, then you get a lot more trust for trying what would otherwise be considered, you know, rather bold scientific ideas. Mm. Okay, any more questions at all? Um, I think one thing that's on my mind is, I seem to get the impression that um, a large amount of work needs to be done at the science policy interface. Um, when I was talking at the American Geophysical Union um, last year, there's a lot of talk about how scientists need to be more involved in political processes because I think people take for granted that evidence-based policy is the is what people gravitate to and it's clearly a trend against it. Um, but I don't think scientists are necessarily the best communicators either. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say is like, do you think a, a way against this would be scientists going beyond what is just due to research and share the data to become more of uh, involved in advocacy? Are you talking about arming ourselves? Calming. Arming. Arming. That would be the American version of that suggestion. <laughs> Calming. Ar carrying weapons. Uh, arming. I, uh, I'm actually a big proponent of scientists being more involved in science policy and politics in general. Show us your gun. I am not a big fan of the fact that, so for example, in uh, the US, uh, most congressional representatives are lawyers. And there's, you know, disgustingly few engineers and scientists by training, or even economists or philosophers or historians, you know, of that, for that matter. 
friend. Who, would, it would be nice to have, you know, some people who are focused on maybe some, some other things and have thought right. about other things more deeply. And, um, and, and so I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of scientists being uh, more involved in, in the process. And, and they should be uh, because, you know, science and scientists are generally asking people for money, uh, for research funds. And so they should, uh, they should be involved in the process. And I know that in the past, uh, this kind of dates back to, in, in the U.S., it dated back to uh, Vannevar Bush, who was uh, the guy who kind of proposed that uh, it was, you know, during kind of like the, uh, the space race uh, post-World War II and the Cold War that uh, scientists are kind of should just be left in their ivory towers. Uh, the government should just give them money let them do wonderful things and, and all this research, you know, good things for society will spill out of it, which is true. Uh, you know, uh, the history shows a lot of good things have come out of all this research, but, but having, um, having them kind of be held at arm's length is, is not probably not a great idea. They, uh, you know, obviously scientists are human and, they have their uh, own preferences too, and and it's perfectly fine for them to express uh, those preferences uh, to pretend that scientists have no perspective that they're purely objective. It is you know it it sets them up as uh, sets up like a, an easy straw man to knock down when the anti scientists find go through the the emails and say oh look they're saying petty things here you know let's let's not uh now we can't believe anything they say yeah Any, that, um, sorry go ahead no that was just more um i think i think my perspective was is I think there's so many advocates for non-science, non-science nonsense, nonsense, um, and anti-intellectualism, but I feel like there needs to be more advocates. If you believe in our policy should be evidence based, you also need to be an advocate for that as well. But um, I don't think it's, it's like prevailing mood in science, like you need to kind of be in this, um, you do to be searching out, put it. And I think that's kind of a hard thing that to change. And it might necessarily not need to be changed for everyone either, but. Well, a, a lot of the change does, in fact, have to be internal, too. Uh, so if one looks at uh, how scientists are uh, evaluated, um, basically, you know, if you wanted to get tenure in a research university, they would look at your, how, what kind of, you know, research grants are you bringing in? What are your publication records? Maybe they'll take a glance at your teaching record or, you know, some other ancillary things, but, you know, it, it's really, you know, people are easily influenced by the measurement system that they're caught in. So if you are being measured by just how many grants you bring in, what, what kind of, uh, what kind of reason would you have to spend time talking to reporters or writing popular publication, uh, you know, bits, trying to explain science and being pro-science to the public. I know a lot of people um, would, uh, in academia, would say terrible things about Carl Sagan, that he was like, essentially, oh, he's, you know, he's just a science populizer, populized, popularizer. He's not a scientist per se. He's, you know, he just goes on TV and says amongst the billions and billions of stars, you know. But clearly, you know, his, uh, his contribution to society is great because he encourages people to uh, enjoy science and support science and, you know, those people are important. We need more Neil deGrasse Tysons, 
not less of them. So to influence public opinion, we need scientists to influence policy. And for scientists to do that, we need to restructure academia, is what I'm getting. <laughs> well, we need, acad we need academia to acknowledge that there is, you know, that your job doesn't end uh, mm. with, with the, as soon as it's been published in nature, you're not done. Yeah. Um, is there any more comments or questions? Um, I think we've got a few more minutes left in the clock if anyone wants to jump in. Otherwise, I think uh, we've reached the end of this uh, talk. Um, yeah, so thanks, Dan, for dropping by and uh, giving this presentation. Um, yeah, again, a bit difficult to do it without. Well, it's difficult to give an applause, but thank you anyway. Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. And uh, I'm very happy that no one Zoom bombed us and yeah. that, uh, where this went off pretty much without a hitch. Yeah, well, yeah, great. Yeah, thank you very much. It's an interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to chat a bit, Dan? We could hold on. I don't sure. know. I mean, you're in charge, right? Are you the host? Uh, Andrea is the host, so she'll. Okay. Uh, Shall we leave now? Or? You can leave <laughs> one. Like I'm just saying, this is a, that's the formal uh, end. This is, this is so uncomfortable. Yeah, you're free. Right. To, of course. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you very much.